welcome to our 2021 LabRoot series sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. My name is Leigh Lavery, a marketing manager for Life Science Electron Microscopy and your moderator today. This is the second webinar in our series and we welcome back any returning attendees and a big hello to any new attendees wherever you are in the world. Many of you know Thermo Fisher from other life science areas, but I want to introduce you to the Life Science Electron Microscopy Division. Our Materials and Structural Analysis Division provides complete workflows from cryo-electron microscopy, structural determination of macromolecular complexes in native states, to 3D reconstruction of tissues and cells. Last year, we broke the atomic resolution cryon barrier with the introduction of the Selectress Imaging Filter with 300 kV cryo TEM. Today, we will be discussing what's possible with the energy filtering for 300 kV and also 200 kV cryo TM and several examples. We will highlight the discoveries of what's now possible to look at underlying protein function and cellular processes with the Selectress Imaging Filter. Today's presentation is titled Cryo-Electron Microscopy Membrane Proteins Down to Atoms. It will be given by my colleagues Mark Storms and Abhai Kutesha and our special guest speaker, Professor Stephen Ohan from UC Berkeley. After today's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please submit your question at any time through the Q&A window. Let me now introduce my colleague, Mark Storms, Product Marketing Manager, to start us off. So welcome everybody to this uh, Thermo Fisher uh, UC Berkeley webinar. Thank you once more, Leah, for introducing us. Um, I'm very excited today to show you again uh, some uh, some new data and new uh, developments actually that we have uh, uh, been working on uh, the last couple of, of months or years actually. Um, and while showing this this video of the cryo-C4, you can very nicely see the interior of the system and what is really inside the cryos and also the components that we talk about today. And I will shortly recap are all inside this, this box, as you, as you know. So for those who have been listening before to this webinar cycle, uh, we have been discussing uh, a lot of new innovations uh, recently, actually, or actually the last couple of years already. Uh, first of all, as a short recap, of course, we have the Cryos G4. You already saw the, the animation on the previous slide. And of course, we also have the Glacios. I think both tools are famous for their uh, significantly reduced height uh, which makes it relatively easy to install the systems in a standard lab room without too uh, significant room renovation efforts, basically. Um, with respect to both platforms, we've also implemented uh, significant automation, not only automation in order to get to the right optical status before you start doing an experiment, the so-called APM or advanced performance monitoring, but also automation in the application software, for example, EPU, which makes it easier to uh, facilitate, for example, the screening of, of grids. And last but not least, of course, we have been pushing the, the productivity uh, by implementing, at least with respect to the platforms, aberration-free image shifting and, and fringe-free imaging, as you, as you all know. Um, the second, actually, branch to the tree, if you like, uh, was introduced last year, the Selectress, uh, which actually is, is uh, yeah, our newly designed and developed uh, energy filter. Uh, it's very famous for its stability. I will spend on the next slide a little bit more time on this. Um, it's also actually very easy to use in terms of setting up the experiment. Um, and in case actually there would be some uh, uh, tuning needed, because of course there is always actually some alignment needed, and this is actually going to happen uh, very easily uh, and then very uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, easily because it uh, has been implemented, this process into our uh, application software, EPU and, and tomography. But I'll get back to that on the next slide with a little bit more details, especially when we talk about the stability. And then the, the third uh, component, which uh, is, of course, also an integral part of the selectors, but it can also be used, of course, standalone, is the Falcon 4 camera. Uh, we have significantly boosted the speed of the Falcon 4 camera, but in addition to that, we have also uh, pushed the DQE, the sensitivity, across the entire full frequency range for those doses that are typically used for cryotomography and, uh, and single particle analysis. But last but not least, we have also implemented this a uh, nice feature called electron defense representation, which actually is a clever way to do more efficient lossless data compression with still, while still benefiting from the full temporal and spatial uh, uh, resolutions. So we can also actually enable 
because of this sub-pixel accuracy capability, the super resolution capabilities of, of the camera. And now I'm pleased actually to announce the fourth addition to this combination. That's why we talk about the power of four actually in this presentation. And that's our um, COLFAC, um, our COLFAC, which we call ECFAC. The E stands for energy spread because we've optimized the energy spread performance of the COLFAC. And as I will show you also in the next couple of slides, um, this COLFAC enables to get higher contrast, push resolutions, especially beyond the two angstrom level. And it also gives us the possibility and gives you the possibility to actually achieve resolutions in a shorter time frame. But first, uh, a little bit, again, some extra information with respect to the selectors. I already mentioned that this is actually a very stable energy filter in terms of the, the, the zero loss position uh, and behavior over a longer period of time, which of course is important if you want to do long and during experiments. Uh, and in these two graphs, you show actually the actual measured performance of the selector stability on the cryos and on the glacios. Um, and you see that, that the behavior, the measured behavior uh, of the serverless position is very well within our specification of plus or minus uh, 1.5 electron volts, which you measure over a period of, of 24 hours. In fact, it's more close to, to plus or minus 1 EV in reality. Uh, so it's extremely stable and a small periodic uh, periodicities that you see here uh, in, in the, as, as a small dip actually in this measurement are related to the auto-filling of, of the liquid nitrogen. Um, as I mentioned, it's actually a very stable filter. So the, in case you have to do some, some, some uh, frequent centering and tuning, it happens uh, yeah, invisible because it's, it's been fully integrated into our application software. And the, uh, the, the fully automated filter alignments uh, are also uh, yeah, done relatively fast. Within less than five minutes, you've really done it. Um, the most actually yeah, practical value, again, is the fact that we have this very stable energy slit. And that basically is a key enabler for very exciting uh, scientific results that will be discussed by Stephen and Abai later in this presentation. And that brings me to the to the cold fact. As I mentioned uh, before, that our new cold fact is optimized for low energy spread. That's what the E stands for, the EC fact or energy spread optimized cold fact. And as you can see in this graph, where we have been comparing the uh, um, the cold fact behavior versus the classical X fact behavior, then you can really see that that the energy spread has significantly been improved. Uh, our official specification here is less than 0 0.3 electron volts compared to the x fact the high brightness x fact which was actually the standard fact on, on our cryos uh, and, and glacials is that has an energy spread of 0 0.7 EV. And the advantage obviously of having this, this better uh, um, energy spread behavior is what you can see back if you look to the contrast uh, uh, transfer function and you see that especially at a high spatial frequency range uh, there is a much stronger contrast signal uh, when you talk about actually the uh, uh, lower energy spread uh, behavior. And that, of course, translates back into uh, higher resolution capabilities. And, and Abai and Stephen will actually talk about that in, this, uh, in, in the, their presentation parts. And also, because of the better contrast behavior, you can reach actually higher resolutions in a shorter possible time. With respect to the other Specifications uh, like the brightness, they are similar to what with the XFX specifications are. So we have a very high brightness actually, but simultaneously we have a very low uh, energy spread performance. Um, Spot drift also same specification as for the as for the XFX in this case, and the uh, uh, irregular flashing, so the regular flashing actually intervals that you have to do every once in a while is also something that doesn't disturb your experimental uh, uh, performance because it's fully automated and embedding in two or EPU and tomography software. So you will not be actually uh, bothered by any of these interruptions with respect to your experiments. And last but not least, um, yeah, our call fact actually has a five-year standard warranty to actually uh, show the confidence that we have in the, in, in the product. And with that introduction on what we call the power of four, I would really like to, to show you and introduce you to uh, to Stephen Brohan, the first uh, speaker, and then Abai will follow up, um, who will talk about yeah, what you can really do with the combination of these powerful instruments. Um, a short introduction, Stephen actually is an assistant professor 
uh, of neurobiology at the University of California in, uh, in Berkeley at the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology um, and the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. Um, their institute is basically focusing and also his work is on understanding the basis of sensory transduction and electrical signaling of the, of the nervous system. And to this end, actually, his lab is using cryo-electron microscopy as a major tool to investigate the structure function relationship of membrane proteins and also ion channels. Um, important to mention is that uh, Dr. Braun is uh, a New York Stem Cell Foundation, uh, Robertson Neuroscience Investigator, and his uh, work has been recognized by many and at many occasions already, for example, with the Sloan Research Fellowship, uh, McKnight Neuroscience School of Awards, and the Kligenstein Simon. Uh, Simon's research fellowship. So we actually we were very happy to have uh, Stephen here today in our uh, webinar series. So I give the floor to you, Stephen. Okay, thank you very much, Leah and Mark, for the introduction and the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm excited to tell you about two short stories from my lab about improvements in resolution of the structures of small membrane proteins um, using the instrumentation that we're discussing here today. And the uh, best of these reconstructions is shown in the background of this slide here at 2.1 angstrom resolution. Um, so the first of these stories concerns a protein called ORF3A. This is a putative viral ion channel encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Uh, we became interested in this protein at the beginning of the pandemic last year as a potential alternative target for vaccine or therapeutic development uh, based on work that had been done in the related SARS-CoV-1. And we're um, also interested in this protein because it appeared to represent a, a novel uh, membrane protein uh, ion channel fold. And so this is a, a very small protein at 31 kilodaltons as a monomer. Um, and so it was a challenging target for cryo-EM, but a fantastic postdoc in my lab, David Kern, was able to, in just a few short months, uh, develop an expression purification system, reconstitute dimeric 3A into lipid nanodisks, and on instrumentation um, here at UC Berkeley, collect data and uh, determine the structure of this protein to 2.9 angstrom resolution and um, the local resolution of, of the final map is shown on the right of the slide here. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, Jonathan Remus and Dan Tasso at the UC Berkeley Cal Cryo facility for coming in at a tough time in the pandemic to collect these data. And Chris Hole, a graduate student in my lab who worked with David to process the, the data and generate this reconstruction. And so we were um, able to learn quite a bit from this uh, really rather high resolution map for such a small membrane protein. Um, and posted a preprint in June of last year describing the results. Um, but we were uh, even more excited to have the opportunity to collaborate with Abe Katecha at Thermo Fisher to see if we could uh, use this new uh, microscope hardware to push the resolution of this reconstruction um, even further. And so we took the grids um, out of the Arctica that we collected the first data set on. Uh, they had crossed his fingers and shipped them to the Netherlands where Abe. Um, was able to collect a data, data set for us, uh, and, and that's shown here. And indeed, from these data, we were, in fact, able to improve the resolution of this reconstruction um, substantially to 2.1 angstrom resolution. And so this was using the Titan Creos um, with cold fag and Selectors X energy filter uh, and the Falcon 4 camera. So you can see immediately, I think, the improvement in map quality um, from the image shown on this slide, and I'll just show the two maps next to one another so um, that the comparison is more clear. It's really substantially more detail in this higher resolution map on the right. Um, I put this table here just to emphasize that these um, data were collected similarly. In fact, it's a smaller data set in the higher resolution um, that led to the higher resolution reconstruction, about half as many final particles. And I also wanted to point out that all of these data are publicly available. The raw movies, the maps, and the models um, are all deposited. And we were excited to see both the EMDB and um, the Coot software package use these data in their recent um, modeling challenges. So we were able to do four additional things in this higher resolution map 
um, compared to our first reconstruction. Uh, first, we were able to model a portion of the membrane scaffold protein, this MSP1E3D1 protein in this kind of tan color on, on the map on the left here. Um, second, we were able to uh, correctly model a, a large number of sidechain rhodomeric positions that were ambiguous in the 2.9 angstrom map, um, but clearly defined in the higher resolution reconstruction. Uh, third, we were able to model uh, approximately 120 ordered water molecules, which are shown in blue in the map of the model here. And um, fourth, we were able to model uh, two um, specifically bound lipid molecules uh, inside the 3A central cavity. Um, so we see that 3A adopts a novel fold here with three transmembrane helices um, and a cytoplasmic beta sandwich domain that uh, assemble tightly into a, into a dimer. And as we were thinking about the putative function of this protein as, a, as an ion channel, um, we observe that 3A adopts um, a structure in which it has a large inner cavity that's, that's polar, that's connected to the cytoplasm and the surrounding membrane through three pairs of water and lipid filled tunnels. And I'll show you those in a little more detail here. So the first set of these tunnels is shown on the left in these slice throughs of the, of the surface of the protein. Um, there's a upper tunnel, pair of upper tunnels, which we speculated were connected to the surrounding lipid bilayer. And indeed, in these tunnels, we don't see um, evidence of bound water molecules, ordered water molecules. There are a pair of lower tunnels that are um, we speculated were connected to the cytoplasmic solution. And in fact, these tunnels were lined with ordered water molecules consistent with that um, idea. And on the other side of the slide here, you can see a third pair of tunnels, these intersubunit tunnels, that had density in the 2.9 angstrom resolution reconstruction that was um, difficult to model, not really interpretable. But in the higher resolution reconstruction, we can see very clearly that these uh, densities correspond to ordered lipid molecules that are bound inside the channel cavity. And we modeled these as uh, a pair of DOPE lipids with the ethanolamine head group of the lipid pointed inside the channel cavity, making interactions with very conserved residues within 3A. And so this um, improvement of resolution is, has helped us think about how this protein might function in, in the viral life cycle as an ion channel um, by uh, adopting this fold in which a large polar cavity is connected to the cytoplasmic solution um, through these lower tunnels um, in which ions can, can freely pass and then potentially traverse to the other side of the membrane through a central pore that's closed in this structure or along um, uh, partially exposed hydrophilic grooves on the outside of the protein. Okay, and so the second story that I'd like to tell you about um, is the following. Concerns a ion channel called TAS2. It's a, a tassium selective channel in eukaryotes. Um, that's pH regulated. And it's uh, one of the conserved um, functions <clears throat> is in the regulation of breathing. Um, where TAS2 senses pH changes that are correlated to changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood to um, determine the firing rate of, nucle of uh, retrotrapezoid nucleus neurons that instruct respiration muscles um, and determine the rate of breathing. So this is a, another small membrane protein. This is about 60 kilodaltons of ordered uh, membrane protein. Uh, this is a two-pore domain family ion channel in which um, two of these canonical potassium channel pore domains are concatenated into a single chain. And so we were interested in understanding how um, protons regulate the activity of this channel and uh, set out to determine its structure. This is work of another fantastic postdoc in my lab, Balvin Lee, who's um, currently on the job market uh, in collaboration with a graduate student, Robert Reedmeyer, uh, in my group. And so Balvin was able to purify TAS2, reconstitute it into lipid nanodisks, and determine its structure at three and a half angstrom resolution using data collected again 
with Dan and John here at UC Berkeley on our Arctica uh, microscope. And so this structure and another structure at, at a lower pH um, allowed us to understand new aspects of how this channel is regulated by protons. And so Balbin and Robert found that task two exhibits two new kinds of channel gate from these two structures, both at around three and a half angstrom resolution. Um, one of these gates is near the extracellular aspect of the channel and involves conformational changes to the selectivity filter, which forms potassium coordination sites that determine the selectivity of this channel for potassium. The second gate is at the intracellular aspect of the channel um, and involves a rearrangement that pinches this region of the channel shut. So similarly, we were interested in whether we could understand more about how this channel operates um, from higher resolution structures. And so Balvin, uh, in an analogous way, took the grids out of our Arctica that we didn't collect on, shipped them to the Netherlands, and Abe was able to collect the data set for us. Um, and these data led to a reconstruction that was again improved substantially from our initial reconstructions, this one to two and a half angstrom resolution. And I'm showing the final map here on the right of this slide. And I just wanted to point out two aspects that we were able to model um, that we were not able to model in the, the lower resolution reconstruction. The first is, again, portions of these membrane scaffold proteins that form the belt around the lipid nanodisc. And in this case, similar to the case of 3A, um, make some specific interactions with uh, residues and transmembrane helices on the channel. And the second aspect are a number of ordered lipid molecules, uh, several of which I've pointed out here. And I'd like to draw your attention to one of these lipid molecules that we can see in the higher resolution map and that I've colored in red on this slide here. And I'm gonna show you a view from the cytoplasmic aspect of the channel up towards this lipid to illustrate why we find this particular lipid very interesting um, functionally. And so this lipid, as it turns out, is uh, bound inside the channel cavity through that kind of lateral membrane opening. And uh, in this position, it sits directly underneath of the potassium selectivity filter. And in this position, it would uh, appear to block conduction. And we find this um, really quite fascinating because there um, is evidence from our work on related channels that this may be a conserved um, uh, means of regulating channel activity in this family um, uh, by having lipid block of ion conduction in this uh, conformation in which lateral membrane openings are exposed. And so what we um, can see in this slide here is that from the lower resolution reconstructions, we were able to understand how protons are sensed on the extracellular and intracellular sides of the channel to gate the channel closed with the selectivity filter and inner gate, respectively. And we're now very interested in understanding how this potential lipid block of ion conduction um, works in these channels and how it uh, interacts with these other proton gates on either side of the membrane. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge my lab um, and again, just point out that the microscopy that I talked about was done by David Kern um, with help from Chris Hole and, and Balvin Lee. And I would like to acknowledge my funding sources and collaborators, especially um, Abe Katecha at Thermo Fisher, um, Dan Tasso and John Remus here at our Cal Cryo, the M facility, um, Diana Bautista and her graduate students, Molly Molly, and Halel Adesnik and his postdoc, Savitha Sridharan, um, who are collaborators on the 3A project um, for functional work that I didn't talk about. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for this wonderful talk. It's, it's really amazing to see because uh, just a few years ago, um, talking about such sub-100 kilodalton proteins and cryo-EM was very difficult to imagine. And now you showed uh, that we can not only work on such uh, proteins, uh, these proteins were very flexible, 
uh, and also very heterogeneous. And yet, uh, you can get such high resolution. This just shows that how how quickly and how such a short time technology has come together, which allows you to answer very difficult biological questions. So what I'm going to do now is uh, spend a few minutes uh, on uh, cryos first, uh, and then go on to talk about uh, Glacial Selectris and Falcon 4 as well. So first, um, as uh, Mark Strom said earlier, uh, the power of uh, 4, uh, that's a Cryos G4, the EC FEG, uh, Selectris, uh, and Falcon 4. Um, here, what we did was, uh, around the uh, end of last year, uh, in December, uh, we did this very nice uh, project. Uh, this, this collaboration was initiated by Tomohiro and Masahiro at uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, they were working there on streptavidin. Uh, streptavidin is a very small uh, 52 kilodalton protein. Uh, it's very flexible and very heterogeneous. Um, in 2019, uh, Hongwei Wang uh, showed for the first time that they can obtain a high resolution structure going to 3.2 angstroms uh, using uh, cryo EM. Uh, they use faceplate at the time to do this. About six months later, uh, another group uh, from Princeton University, Ning Yang's group, uh, pushed the resolution further to 2.6 angstroms without using the face plates. Um, end of last year, um, Tomohiro and Masahiro started uh, testing uh, this streptavidin uh, on their new Cryos uh, G4. Um, and this is how uh, it looked like. So this is the grid uh, on which they collected the data. Uh, these were uh, the areas, uh, grid squares, uh, where data was collected using uh, G4 at Tokyo with uh, BioQuantum K3. Uh, and from this, uh, they obtained this uh, beautiful structure of the streptavidin going to 1.9 angstrom. This is already beautiful because this, this is the first uh, structure of a sub-100 kilodalton protein going to sub-2 angstrom resolution. What we did next was even more exciting. Uh, they took this grid out from their autoloader in their lab in Tokyo, and they shipped the same grid uh, to Netherlands, to me. And what we did is, uh, using um, my microscope, the Cars G4 with the CFX Selectris uh, and Falcon 4, uh, I collected the data uh, in the similar uh, grid squares uh, near where they had collected uh, the previous data set. Uh, we tried and made sure that we keep as many parameters as possible constant. So in terms of uh, pixel sizes were similar, in terms of those was kept similar. Uh, the defocus range uh, was kept uh, similar. Uh, it was a different microscope uh, and uh, has a Selectris uh, and Falcon 4 detector on it. Uh, and then this is how uh, the data looks like. Uh, this is one of the image of streptavidin. It's uh, low pass filtered to about 20 angstroms, so we can clearly see all the particles here. Uh, and Masahiro went ahead and processed uh, this data. And with similar amount of uh, particles, uh, he produced this beautiful 1.7 angstrom structure from the same grid. Now, this is, this is even more exciting that we can further uh, even after the grid was sitting in the microscope for some time and was transported um, published a paper uh, with uh, LMB Cambridge on uh, atomic resolution structure of apoferritin uh, as well as 1.7 angstrom structure of a uh, human GABA receptor. There, with the GABA receptor, we saw that at 1.7 angstrom, we can actually see hydrogen atoms. Uh, so then the question was, can we really see the hydrogens even here with uh, 1.7 angstrom data? Um, this was done uh, in collaboration with uh, people at LMB Cambridge, uh, especially Kietaro, uh, who works uh, in Galit Mashudo's group. Um, and indeed, we can actually see hydrogens in this difference density here. All these little sticks that we see, as well as these green blobs, uh, these are the densities for hydrogen atoms. So not only uh, we can push the resolution of such a small protein to 1.7 angstrom, but now hydrogen atoms are also visible. Um, again, showing how far uh, this technology has come in a very short period of time. 
So this is how uh, we have been working so far. These are all the structures uh, that we have derived uh, using the cryos with Selectris and Falcon 4. Uh, I already showed uh, this 1.7 angstrom structure within. Uh, last year, I also showed you a hemoglobin structure going to two angstroms. Um, Steve gave a wonderful talk and showed that even with membrane proteins, uh, challenging membrane proteins, because these were very flexible and very heterogeneous samples, uh, we can push the resolution to 2.1 angstrom in case of this uh, 3A ion channel, um, as well as um, 2.5 angstrom for the human potassium channel. Um, again uh, showcasing uh, what we can do nowadays uh, even with such small proteins uh, and cryo-electron microscopy. Moving further, uh, we have this wonderful collaboration with a uh, group of Radu Arasis crew uh, at MRC LMB as well in Cambridge uh, where they are interested in looking at structure-based uh, drug design. Uh, Radu is working on a human GABA receptor uh, GABA receptor is a 200 kilodalton uh, human membrane protein found in our brains. Uh, it's acting as a neurotransmitter and it's responsible for uh, our moods, uh, depression. Uh, it's also uh, controlling uh, anxiety, epilepsy, insomnia, and it has been a target uh, for all these diseases. Uh, in addition, uh, it's also the drug target for things like uh, sleeping pills. Uh, as well as uh, anesthetics. So it's, it's a very important receptor. Uh, it's an asymmetric uh, protein, uh, forms a chloride ion channel, and there are lots and lots of drugs uh, against uh, this channel. One of the problem is uh, this channel could not be crystallized uh, at all after decades and decades of work. Uh, only way to get structures is by cryo-electron microscopy. So we looked at uh, this sample uh, and Again, we can see these wonderful results uh, on a bottom mounted Falcon 3 or Falcon 4. Uh, for these three different drugs here, uh, we can obtain uh, 2.6 angstrom uh, structures where you can clearly see how this drug is bound. Uh, and in case of two of these uh, drugs, uh, we managed to put them onto Selectris uh, Falcon 4 system. Uh, in case of uh, this RO154513, uh, which is a drug against alcohol uh, intoxication, uh, we used exactly the same grid, uh, which went on to the bottom-mounted Falcon 4 first, and then went on to the Selectris Falcon 4, and the resolution was improved to 2.2 angstroms. And in case of uh, Zopiclone, uh, resolution was uh, improved even further to 1.9 angstroms. Um, we also looked at uh, more uh, drugs. Uh, here I'm showing you two more examples. Uh, Alprazolam, which is a drug against uh, anxiety as well as panic disorder, going to also 2.2 angstroms. Uh, and Dizapam, uh, the drug against Caesar, uh, going to uh, 2.5 angstroms. So now we have like this range of uh, structures with all these different drugs bound uh, within this GABA receptor. And Radu's team is uh, working on trying to understand the function of this uh, and use this structure to do some rational design to make the drugs better, to reduce the side effect, to, 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 to just uh, improve its uh, capabilities. So this is what we can uh, do uh, with Cryo-EM, with Cryos and Selectris and Falcon 4. Uh, and now what I would like to show you is uh, spend a few minutes trying to show what we have been doing with the Selectris and Falcon 4 also on a 200 kV glaciers uh, system. On the glaciers, uh, so here we looked at uh, proteosome uh, T20S. Uh, this is a collaboration with a group of Jürgen Plitzko uh, at the Max Planck Institute. Um, on uh, unfiltered images with Falcon 4, so like kind of simulating a bottom mounted system, um, we can see particles when, when we go further away from focus. So here about uh, 0.8 micron D focus, we can start to see that yes, particles are present. Uh, but when we are closer to focus uh, at 0 0.4 micron, particles are hardly visible. As soon as we do the filtering uh, with the 10 EV slit, uh, in this case, the contrast improves uh, miraculously. Uh, as you can see, like uh, very close to focus as well, all of these particles are visible. 
uh, and it's not just a contrast, uh, it's also the signal to noise uh, that's improving in these images. Um, and since you have better signal to noise, uh, particles are aligning better, and this leads to higher resolution. Uh, and this is exactly what we observed here. Uh, with unfiltered particles, uh, we can get about uh, 2.34 angstrom structure. Um, when we use a 20 EV slit, resolution is further improved uh, by about 0 0.08 angstroms going to 2.26. Uh, and when we use even narrow slits, so now we are removing all the noise from this plasmon peak, the resolution is further improved to 2.14 angstrom. That's a massive difference going from 2.3 to 2.14. It also shows uh, that the 20 EV slit, which is generally used as uh, Standardly in the field um, is, is good, but with 10 EV, you can get even better resolution. Um, now, it's about uh, 0.12 angstrom difference between 20 and 10 EV, and about 0.08 angstrom difference between um, unfiltered uh, versus uh, filtered uh, imaging. Is this significant? Huh? Uh, if we look at the B factors, uh, then we can see that yes, there is there is definitely a big change going on from unfiltered versus filtered. Now all this data was collected on exactly same grid, uh, keeping as many parameters same uh, as we possibly can, uh, and it was also collected consecutively uh, within uh, one and a half days. Uh, each of this data set took about 12 hours. Uh, it was running at about 250 movies per hour using office. So we, we try to keep as many things same as possible uh, and still can op obtain such high resolution structures. We can also look at this uh, by plotting these B factors. So here uh, I'm plotting the B factors in an exponential form. Uh, and what we can see um, is this green line uh, come belongs to the 10 EV slit, uh, 20 EV is the yellow line, and the unfiltered is the red. And there's already a difference uh, between uh, these uh, data sets. If we were to just uh, take a point uh, on this plot, let's say two angstroms, uh, how many particles we would need to reach two angstroms? Then it becomes clear that uh, with 10 EV slit, we will need about 370,000 particles of this type uh, to reach two angstroms if we use 10 EV. Uh, if we were to use a 20 EV slit, uh, then we will need 1 million particles uh, to reach the same resolution. Uh, and if we don't use the slit at all, if we use bottom mounted Falcon 4 without any filtering, uh, then it would almost become impossible for this data to reach uh, 2.1 angstrom or two angstroms in this case. Um, so indeed, uh, selectress or energy filtering uh, is helping you tremendously, even uh, at uh, 200 kV uh, as well. Now, this was all done uh, with uh, uh, proteasome 20S, which is a 700 kilo Dalton protein and has a D7 symmetry. Uh, next, we wanted to see what happens if you put something more uh, challenging and something smaller. Uh, so we tried this on a GABA receptor again. Uh, this is a homopentameric form of GABA. Uh, it has a five-fold symmetry, uh, 200 kilo Dalton protein. Uh, and there we can see the difference is even bigger. Uh, with unfiltered, uh, we can get 2.8 angstrom resolution. Uh, with 10 EV, the resolution is improved to 2.4 angstrom. It's like a difference of 0 0.4 angstroms. And also with less number of particles. And again, everything was done using the same grid uh, and same parameters uh, between the two sets. So once again, it shows that filtering is really helping uh, push your resolution uh, for single particle analysis. Uh, and at this resolution, you can already see your uh, bound drug molecules. You can see all the ordered uh, water molecules and can be used for structure-based uh, drug discovery. Now. This is again, this has C5 symmetry. Uh, we wanted to see what happens if we put even more challenging sample with which doesn't have any symmetry. Um, for that, uh, we tried to look at a GPCR sample. Uh, this is a collaboration with the group of Patrick Saxon uh, at Monash uh, University, uh, as well as uh, Radostin Danau uh, at Tokyo University. Um, here we looked at uh, GPCR sample GLP1R. 
uh, um, another thing we did was uh, we wanted to also uh, we wanted to like push even further and see what happens if we if we try and look at sub hundred kilo Dalton proteins. Uh, for this, uh, we have another collaboration, uh, and this collaboration is with uh, Basil Graeber at the Institute of Cancer Research uh, in London, uh, where he's working on uh, this uh, human CDK activating kinases, the CDK cyclins. Um, he sent us this uh, sample. Now, this sample was uh, was very challenging because uh, not only it's uh, very flexible, it has very high heterogeneity, but also a significant portion also has uh, preferential orientation. Uh, however, uh, with um, Selectress and Falcon 4 on the glaciers, uh, we managed to find a population uh, where there were all the uh, orientations present uh, and the structure was pushed to 2.5 angstroms. Again, showing that what we can do even with the sub 100 kilo Dalton, uh, this protein is about 85 uh, kilo Dalton in the aligned region. There is also some flexible bits, um, about uh, 15 kilo Dalton, which, which is not visible in cryo EDM map because it's, it's highly flexible. So also with the glaciers, uh, we have seen a range of different structures, uh, starting from apophyretin uh, going to 1.7 angstrom, the T20S uh, to 2.1 angstrom, uh, this 85 kilo Dalton uh, CDK activating kinase to 2.5 angstroms. Uh, we also looked at the hemoglobin, which is a 64 kilo Dalton protein, uh, which went to about 3.4-ish uh, uh, angstrom uh, resolution. Uh, and in case of membrane proteins, uh, we looked at the GABA going to 2.4, uh, and uh, this GPCR sample going to 2.6 angstroms. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators uh, for this wonderful support throughout this work and also contributing to this really nice samples and all their expertise. Uh, and I would also like to thank you everyone for listening to this webinar. Thank you. Let me start with the, the first question. So uh, I think I'll ask this one of Abhai. What resolution do you need for meaningful interpretation of the drug, for drug discovery? Sorry, Leia, there was a lot of echo in the beginning. Uh, could okay. you repeat the question? I just heard my name. No problem. Uh, what resolution do you need for meaningful interpretation for drug discovery? Ah, okay. All right. Um, so for it, it actually depends uh, on what question you are asking. Uh, if you just want to see whether a ligand or your drug molecule is uh, present in, in the binding pocket or not, uh, then you don't need uh, very high resolutions. Uh, one could get this uh, information already at around 3, 3.5 angstroms, in some cases even around 4 angstroms. Um, if you want to start identifying uh, how this uh, ligand is interacting uh, with the surrounding environment, uh, then you need higher resolution. Um, once you are at 2.5 angstroms, um, you start to see how, how, how this binding is happening, what all the uh, hydrogen atoms uh, are there. You can model uh, the ligand properly as well as all the side chains uh, in your uh, binding pocket. 
uh, and as soon as you start going uh, higher and higher resolution, like going from 2.5 to about 2.22 uh, angstroms, you start to see all the water molecules. Uh, and water molecules play a very important role, especially when you want to do like a structure-based uh, drug discovery. So I would say like uh, anywhere between 2 and 2.5 angstroms, uh, you start getting more uh, accurate uh, details. Um, from 2.5 to 3 angstroms, uh, you you can still uh, see that how your uh, ligand is bound and how it's interacting um, uh, with a uh, little less accuracy. And uh, from 3 angstroms to 4 angstroms, you can do some predictions uh, there. Great. Would you agree to you uh, with this? Steve, can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Sorry, just didn't didn't catch that. Yeah, I think that's a that's that's, that's exactly what I would say as well. More more information you can learn more about the details of these interactions, but yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, so for in terms of um, maybe resolution, so how much do you affect do you think the higher magnification on the cryos had on the final resolution of these maps? Up higher, Mark, would you like to answer? Yeah, I, I can at least say for in our case, we don't know, we haven't done a, a, a comparison with the exact same pixel size on, on different microscopes. Okay. And uh, I think it's maybe a specific question to your task two project um, for you, Steve. Um, have you tried modulating different lipids for the nano disc, uh, such as lipids unique to the brain or other organs? Yeah, that's a great question. We have not yet. We'd be very interested in doing that, um, especially with the higher resolution structures now where we can, we can really make out um, what some of these interactions look like. Okay, thank you. Um, so then I think question for Abhai, was the streptavidin data set also collected with the um, Colsex or only Falcon 4 and Selectris? The streptavidin data was collected with the Colfeg, uh, Selectris and Falcon 4. Okay. Um, and given the same conditions, you know, sample grid detector, um, what would be a typical difference in the overall resolution range expected um, observed in the data set collected on a cryos and, and glacios? Uh, that uh, depends. Uh, we have done uh, some experiments um, with uh, T20S uh, and uh, GABA uh, sample. Uh, I showed you some T20S data. Uh, with uh, Selectris uh, and Falcon 4, uh, we can achieve this 2.1 angstroms on the glaciers. Um, same sample, it was not exactly the same grid, it was a different grid, but same sample, same kind of ice thickness. Uh, when collected uh, on the cryos, we can also, cryos with a bottom mounted camera first, uh, we can also achieve um, to 2.1 angstrom. However, with less number of particles, I think it was uh, almost half the number of particles uh, there. Uh, in case of uh, GABA receptor now, where uh, there is a lower symmetry, uh, some more flexibility, some more challenges, uh, there the difference starts to become uh, slightly bigger. Um, on the glaciers with selectress, we get 2.4 angstrom. On uh, cryos with a bottom mounted Falcon 4, uh, we get to two angstroms. Uh, and uh, cryos with Selectris and Falcon 4, uh, we push it to 1.7 angstroms uh, in case of a symmetric uh, form of GABA. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe just a quick follow up question um, related to a few questions about Selectris. So, have you tested the benefit of the Selectris on samples with thicker ice? or tilt the samples when the resolution is usually limited? Um, not, not really like a, a direct side-by-side -side comparison where uh, I look at the same sample on a thick and uh, thin ice. Uh, but in principle, uh, when you have a thicker sample, uh, you have more inelastic scattering. Uh, filtering should help uh, even more. But it is a very good question, and, and we should we should do some uh, experiments on this. In theory, uh, yes, uh, it should help. And this is all the whole basis of tomography, that thicker sample filtering is going to help you much more. OK. Um, so we also have a few questions about the, the nano disks. So um, 
with the nanodist results without the proteins, were they president solution? I can see that's for you. Oh, with, yeah, when we purify um, samples of nanodist, typically there's um, some portion of the sample that are empty nanodisks that are going to be frozen along with the target in nanodisks. And we just need to remove those computationally as we as we process data. Okay, and, and then maybe same question. Um, the concentrations of the um, nanodisks, were they too high or? <laughs> um, I think they work quite well. So that's that's actually how they do look high. They, you know, we like to have the particles um, tiled um, quite closely on the grid. We find that it um, gives us thinner ice and um, makes makes processing easier. Actually, so that's that's about where we like them to be. Um, in those two cases, they're um, between one and two mg per mil for the three A project and the test two project. Um, but that's quite sample dependent. Um, what concentration we need to, to go to to have distribution that looks similar to what you saw on the slides today. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, based on your experience, uh, what are the suitable detergents for membrane protein cryo EM grids? Um, and how did you overcome the difficulties caused by the detergents? Uh, okay, Maybe Steve or Abhai, I don't know if you want to answer that first. Or... Sure. Our we tend to um, prefer to be in nanodisks, and so that's how we avoid the problem. But Abe probably has um, mm -hmm. more experience with other detergents. Uh, indeed. I mean, uh, this is this is why we want to move everything towards nanodisks. Uh, it was the same with GABA as well. All the GABA work that I showed, uh, the sample was within the nanodisks. Uh, when when Radu's group uh, tried uh, in early days with detergents, uh, they saw lots of differences uh, in in how this channel was um, uh, behaving because the channel is very dynamic. Uh, in most cases, the channel was uh, found to be collapsed. Um, so yeah, generally, if you can, uh, you should move away from detergent. Try to go towards nano disks with lipids from uh, uh, similar environments uh, if possible. Uh, but but if there is no other option, uh, you can always try uh, with uh, DDM, uh, for example. Uh, that's the first detergent uh, that uh, I have been trying. Um, now there are even better detergents. Uh, LMNG, for example, uh, has, has been shown to work very well uh, with uh, membrane proteins. Um, and there are also several detergent screens um, already available, which you could try. But again, the same, I would say the same thing, that if, if you can use nanodisks, um, I would go with nanodisks um, uh, instead of going through the detergent route. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, maybe along those same lines, um, question was asked, like, for the resolution improvement of these cases, how much can you attribute of hardware, you know, and how much is can be attributed to protein preparation specific um, conditions? Uh, the sample prep is, is, is always the main thing. Um, uh, in terms of hardware, um, with uh, using uh, standard uh, samples, uh, such as uh, epocreatin, for example, uh, we can test our hardware very well. Uh, and last year, uh, we showed that using the same system, uh, this CARS G4 with uh, c selectors and Falcon 4, when we use uh, epocreatin sample, we could really get to the atomic resolution and we could get 1.2 angstrom with the best uh, B factors uh, ever. Um, so we know that, yes, hardware is good. Uh, now you have, we have to work towards optimizing uh, the samples. And it happens uh, in, in two things, like you need to have like optimized uh, grids uh, first. Um, and there are lot, lots and lots of uh, improvements happening on the grid side. Uh, more recently, uh, we saw this wonderful grid from Chris Russo, where they use uh, hexagonal four. Now also, uh, Chris and Lori uh, a few years ago showed that the bull grids uh, are much better, and we also see the same thing. Uh, the bull grids uh, do uh, behave better in terms of this motion uh, compared to the carbon grids. So that's one thing. Uh, second thing uh, is your ice uh, quality. Uh, of course, uh, thinner ice the better, uh, but uh, at some stage you start uh, having problems with uh, air-water interface if you try and uh, do much thinner ice, or even ice starts melting in some cases. Uh, 
Um, and then also sample. Uh, sample has to be if if we put uh, very flexible or uh, very heterogeneous sample, uh, then then we are not going to get uh, very high resolutions. Uh, so again, some biochemistry uh, helps there. Okay, thanks. So you started talking about the hardware. I'll, I'll switch there for this question. Um, will the ECFAG also be available for retrofit, retrofit possibilities on existing cryos microscopes? Uh, Mark? Yes, Leah, this is indeed uh, the case. So if you have a cryos of the generation G3 or G3i, and you uh, upgrade the instrument to Windows 10, then you can indeed have the Colfac uh, retrofitted onto those instruments. Okay. And of course, in addition to that, the price defaults, of course, can always be equipped also as a retrofit later on in the field if you decide to, to add on a, a call effect later on. Okay. Um, you also talked about the flashing interval that is fully integrated into EPU and Tomo software. But when is such a flashing procedure triggered and what is the interval between the flashing generally? Um, Mark, I think that was yeah, so yeah, so typically, actually, when the beam current drops 10%, then uh, you get actually uh, a trigger of uh, a flashing procedure. In the, uh, the Nature paper of, uh, of Nakanadal, we have actually reported that uh, such interval is, is roughly eight hours between the flashes. But we have also seen on our internal instruments that we can easily reach uh, intervals which are more than 10 hours, so really actually a long time. Okay, thanks. So I think this will be our, our last question. Um, this one will be for, for Steve. Was there a difference in the data processing of the small proteins with the cryos data? Was it difficult to process the data for such small proteins? Yes, good question. Um, they were difficult data sets to process. Um, that's, that's for sure. I think that you know, it is a testament to how um, talented David and Balvin in my lab who process those data and Chris Hall um, are, that they got these things to work. We did not, though, see, you know, if anything, it was, it was maybe a little bit easier to process data collected um, with the selectress um, on um, obvious microscope than it was to process data from the Arctica. But um, both use similar pipelines, and you can kind of check out the details in the in the papers and the preprint and those um, use um, a kind of approach that we found to be um, pretty robust for a few projects of similar size targets. Okay, great. So uh, I think with that I want to thank you again, um, Steve, Mark, and Abhai for your time today and for giving answering questions as well as your sharing your important research. Um, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for your interesting questions. Uh, questions, unfortunately, that we didn't have time for today and those submitted during the um, on-demand period will be addressed uh, by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Um, if you are a current customer and would like more information, such as a data sheet, please contact your account manager. Um, if you don't know who that is, um, please contact us. Um, in the forms and the links provided in the resource window um, in the LabRoots um, module. Uh, this webcast can be viewed on demand. Um, LabRoots will alert you with an email when it's available for replay. Uh, we encourage you to share uh, that email with your colleagues um, that may have missed today's live event. Um, please join us again on May 19th for our next webinar on our next Thermo Fisher Electron Microscopy Monthly Series on LabRoots. Um, you'll be hearing about our new capabilities for correlative microscopy and our integrated light fluorescence microscope that is part of our electron cryotomography workflow. Uh, the registration is open. So again, thanks again to our speakers. Thanks for all for joining us. Um, until next time. Goodbye.